I'm Julie Lerman. I am a software coach, a developer, and a big data nerd. I am not a DevOps guru, but I use Docker all the time in development and testing. And one of the things I love is that I can use my database and database server in a container, and it's just another component in my software projects. So I'm really happy I get to share that with you today. So we all know things change over time and our ideas and designs evolve. Sometimes it takes centuries, like getting from this old heavy wooden bike with notice no pedals to the titanium bike I get to ride. And not only is it very lightweight, but yay, it has pedals. That's good for the uh, steep Vermont climbing that we have to do here. So in our businesses and especially our software, things obviously are moving much more rapidly. And if you're working in a brownfield application, your logic is changing, your goals are changing, things are evolving really, really quickly. But fortunately, we have tools that makes it easy for us to share those changes across our team. We've got package managers. We are, many people are really already familiar with using containers for frameworks and APIs and things like that. Um, but we also are able to share that not just with developers, but across with the testers and people doing the UX and even push all of that up into CICD. And that area, the serve CICD server can spin up everything that it needs or grab what it needs to from the package managers, et cetera, to run things through testing in an automated way. So that's great for code. Most of our apps are persisting data as well, but the data and the databases and those servers for the databases are totally left out of the loop of our agile workflow. And this ends up causing a lot of friction because as our model is evolving in the software, that often means that the schema of the database is going to evolve as well. So then we're stuck sending uh, schema updates across to the team and everybody's kind of on their own when it comes to making sure the database is in line. So I'm going to focus on SQL Server. Um, there's a couple of reasons for that. First of all, relational databases are still a huge part of the ecosystem. I know that um, thinking about your model evolving, if you're using NoSQL, if you're using a document DB, it's really not a big deal. But there are so many people still using uh, relational databases and uh, SQL Server is one that I happen to focus on. So I'll actually be demoing SQL Server with this. So thinking about relational databases, those schema changes, right? We've got SQL files we've to send across. Everybody's kind of on their own, doing their own thing of applying those schema changes to their database. And goodness, if somebody says, hey, we're all going to switch to SQL Server 2019 now, everybody's got to go and install that on their computer. And I don't know if you've ever installed SQL Server on your development machine or your testing machine. Um, it's a kind of a big deal. So what we really need is a consistent process that includes the database, right? Instead of having all of this automated process that we've got for everything else, but then database, oh, sorry, now you got to stop and deal with that on your own. And everybody's got their maybe own way to do that. We can use Docker to just make this part of the simple workflow. So if I'm talking about SQL Server, and I'm talking about Docker, it may be a surprise still to many that SQL Server is available as a Docker image. So the way that came about was first Microsoft enabled SQL Server to be in Linux. In other words, they created a Linux version of SQL Server, but it's not like some stripped down version of SQL Server. It's still exactly the same SQL Server database and server that we have always that we've always had in Windows. So that started with SQL Server 2017. Once it was on Linux, then it was almost a no brainer that you could then put SQL Server inside of a Docker image. And now we've got this benefit of, you know, run, uh, run the image, Docker run, and all of a sudden you've got SQL Server available to you. So there's a few side notes I think are important to make sure you're aware of. Um, first of all, here's a link 
to where you can learn more about SQL Server on Linux. Um, but also SQL Server images, actually micro, all of Microsoft's images, they moved off of Docker Hub onto their own registry. So you'll find pages for their different images on Docker Hub, but the images are all stored in their registry, which is at uh, mcr.microsoft.com. So here's the link for where you would pull the image from Microsoft's registry. Also, just as an FYI, I use Linux containers all the time, but there are versions of SQL Server for Windows in Windows containers. So that's good to be aware of. So with SQL Server inside a Docker container, it's now just another component in your application. It's just a matter of adding a little more code that's shared in your source control. And with that, the database is now part of your source control. And all of these benefits that we realize from Docker now apply to the database. Um, even the isolation is amazing because with Docker running, you could have multiple instances or multiple containers of database servers, different versions of them running easily at the same time. So you can test on different servers in case you're deploying to your software to companies where they might be responsible for the database server. Um, and also, this isn't just about sharing source control. I mean, consider uh, new developers or new testers, new people on your team setting up a development machine, setting up that environment, right? There's so much less work to do now. So all of those great benefits from Docker also now are applied to the database. I want to be sure you see a container running kind of on its own, not just as part of source control. And you do need to be aware that we can't just call Docker run. You do have to provide some specific environment variables like except EULA equals yes. Even if you're using one of the license free versions of SQL Server, you've got to provide a password and there are some rules for what the password should look like. And of course, we do need to give it some port information. So what port on the host machine to pipe it through. So even in a container, we can access it from the host and also within the container, what port it should be available on. And then of course, remember that it's not on Docker Hub, it's on Microsoft's registry. So mcr.microsoft.com. I've already got my SQL Server image pulled onto my machine and I've got no containers running. So it's Docker run. And because I can't memorize all that stuff, <laughs> I'm just going to go for it here. So there are the environmental variables, um, the EULA, the password. And since I'm just demoing, I like to use a password that I can actually remember. And I'm exposing it to the host port of 1601. And internally, it'll be 1433, which is the SQL Server default. So I'll go ahead and run that. Now, the prompt comes back immediately. That's because the container is running, but SQL Server is still doing a little more work. We can take a look at it here and you can see the logs are still running along. The image contains some bash scripts and some SQL scripts. So as it starts up, it runs all of that stuff. So it's setting up everything that SQL Server needs like the master tables and things like that. But I just want to scroll up to the top so you can see. So it started at 201240 and it finished at 21254. So it was 15 seconds, right? The container started instantly and it took 15 seconds for SQL Server to really be up and running. So now I'm going to flip over to Azure Data Studio and just connect to it there. So this is through port 1601 where it's exposed on the host. I'm going to stick it inside of my little Docker folder and the green light says it's connected and there's the system databases. Now I can go ahead and uh, create tables, create data, run SQL against it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Do all of that work. One thing that it's important to understand for these demos, I'm going to let Docker create all of that stuff, the data of, for the database inside of the same container where the server is running. 
Now, that's because I'm just running demos and I'm testing, right? So when the container comes down, I don't anticipate wanting to persist that data. I could tell Docker that I wanted it to have all of the data, including the master tables and things like that, in a separate volume. And then I can take down the container, right, and bring all those resources back. And then when I spin up a new container, I could point it to that volume again. But for the purposes of dev and test, I don't have any need to persist that data. So I'm just going to let it go right inside of the same container where the database is. So there are a lot of options for doing automated migrations or running scripts against database. And your set of options might be different for smaller databases than for large ones. So a large database would be needed, for example, if you're doing performance testing against the against the database and you want to have millions of rows available after you've spun the container up. So there's ways to get that into a new container. So for my purposes, uh, the smaller solutions are perfectly feasible and a lot easier to use. So the one I'm using is called Flyway. And it is an open source project that was um, taken over, uh, purchased by Redgate. So Redgate has a lot of wonderful database tools. So they took that project, they put a dedicated team on it. And so it's really in good hands and and has a great future. So Flyway is also available as a Docker image. And therefore, I'm going to incorporate that and use that to get my database um, into the database container once it's spun up. So be good to take a quick look at the project. I have an ASP.NET Core API project. It's pretty simple. I think the only really interesting thing in here is that the connection strings coming from an environment setting in the API's container that Docker Compose read from a Docker environment variable file and pushed into that container. So that's one important thing. The next project in here is also .NET Core, and it's a testing project. It'll run some simple unit tests, but it also will run some integration tests against the controller, which will ensure that the API is correctly interacting with the database. And for our purposes, that means also that the containers are all running and interacting with each other properly. The other folder in here is called Flyway, and that's what's going to provide a container for the Flyway application to perform the migration for us. I think the only interesting thing in here is that there's a SQL folder, and in the SQL folder are two SQL scripts that Flyway will run against the database server for me. So the first script creates some credentials in the server, it creates the database and the schema of the database. The second script seeds some data into that new database. And then the rest that we have in here is the Docker stuff. I've got two sets of files. Uh, one is for the API and the other is for the test. Each one has a Docker file, a Docker Compose file, and also a YAML file for my pipeline. So let's take a look at how the Docker Compose files are going to do this magic for us. Um, I have, remember, there's a separate Docker file and Docker Compose file just for the API project, and then another one just for the test project. And they work a little differently. The Docker Compose for the API starts by spinning up the database container. Once that's ready and ready, remember, it has to run through all of that SQL script. So that took, we saw about 15 seconds. And once that's ready, then the Flywing container will start up and it will do its task, which is to apply some SQL to the database inside of the SQL Server container. When it's done, that shuts down and then the API's container will spin up and the API container is then able to connect to and interact with the data in the database. Then the API container sits around and waits for requests to come into it. And that's that. Now the database um, or the testing container is a little different. So it starts the same. We have the database container spins up, 
does all its work. When it's ready, Flyway will start doing its job so that the, the Flyway container starts up quickly, but then it waits and waits and waits and waits those 15 seconds until the database is ready in the server. So then it does that task of applying the SQL and then it shuts itself down. And then the third container, now this isn't the ASP.NET Core app, this is the test app, right? So it's a .NET Core application, but within it, it has a dependency on the ASP.NET Core API. So that spins up and it runs its tests, including the integration tests that have a dependency on the database. And once the tests are finished running, then that container shuts down as well. So let's take a look at this in action and take a look at some of the code in the Docker Compose files. So back into the code, here's the Docker Compose that runs the API itself. The first service is to create the container for the API itself. It has to build up its own image. The instructions for that are in Dockerfile, which is here. It also knows to create an environment variable inside that container. And that variable is going to be the variable behind connection strings dbcon inside of the env file. And then this service depends on the migration container. So Docker Compose will know what order to run things in. So the next service is for the database. It relies on the existing image, uh, Microsoft's SQL Server image. I'm passing in the environment variables and also specifying the ports. So this time I'm using port 1620 on the host, just like I did when I ran the container at the command line and I exposed it on 1601 on the host. So the last one is the migration container, and that's going to depend on the flyway image. And I'm just giving it a name. It needs to create its own volumes. One is where the SQL script files will get stored, and the other is for binaries. For the entry point, we're just going to run the flyway command, which will look inside the SQL folder for the SQL scripts and run all the SQL scripts that it found. Now, you may be familiar with using the wait for it bash script when you're dealing with waiting for dependent containers to be ready, but that actually doesn't seem to work with the flyway container. Uh, it took me a long time to figure this out. So I'm not using wait for it, but instead what I'm doing is in the parameters for the command, I'm using the Flyways connect retries parameter. So that'll retry every second for however many seconds you specified until it's actually able to connect to the database. And when it can connect, then it will run the flyway command. And then there's just more parameters in there, uh, making sure it knows what the database is, and I'm passing in my password. So I'm also saying that this service depends on the service called DB. The really interesting thing that Docker Compose is doing as it's orchestrating all of these containers is the service name DB becomes the name of the database server everywhere that I'm referring to it. So Flyway knows that the server is called DB and the connection string also knows that the server is called DB. So this is how all of those things are going to come together. So I'm going to take advantage of the Docker extension in Visual Studio Code. I can right click on Docker Compose and there's Compose Up. I also want to point out if you haven't used it, that that same Docker extension also shows you what's going on, but we will pair the information we get here with the information that the Docker desktop dashboard gives us because that also is really rich. Okay, so back to the files and I can go ahead and compose up. So it was building up the image for the API. We can see the containers are there and all are running. Let's look over at Docker Desktop Dashboard to see what's going on. So the SQL Server is still doing its job. 
of uh, running its initialization SQL script. So Flyaway is still waiting for SQL Server to be ready in that container. So you can see it's uh, trying the connection again and again. A couple of times it finally connected. And once it connected, then Flyaway is running. It found the two migration SQL files that I added into that project. So I'll go back and see what's going on here. So the overall state of the containers now is that the Flyway migration container is finished, so it stopped, and the database and the API containers are still running, and we can see that in the Visual Studio extension as well. So I will open up Chrome and browse to the API, and there is all the data coming out of the database. So we saw that those containers were both running, but now this is really proof that also the orchestration is working. So not only was Flyway able to access the container in the database and do all its work, but also my API container is able to find the database container and interact with it. That's some of my seed data you can see there. So I'm going to take these down. Um, I can do that just by using the extension. And there go the containers. They're gone. So that was the API. Now let's take a look at the Docker Compose for the testing. So just, um, we didn't look at the test before. Again, there's just some straight unit tests that just interact with the classes and have nothing to do with the database or the controllers. And then some integration tests that hit the controllers the um, most important of those for our purposes is this last test, which hits the Agilistas controller, hits the get async rest method, and that's the one that is going to hit the database, query the database, and bring back some data. And we're validating that at least one of those results that came back has my name in it because that was some of the seed data that I put in there. You don't want to right click on the compose file and choose compose up here because it adds the minus D flag. That means the container's running interactively, but I don't want the test container to run interactively. I need it to just start up, do its thing, right? Instead of waiting for me to tell it what to do. So I'll remove the interactive flag. We're going to see a lot more happening. It's going to start showing us all of the logs coming out of the database and flyaway containers. And because this is pre recorded, I get to fast forward for you. So now the tests uh, ran because everything else had finished doing its work. The container for the database was up. Flyaway waited and waited and was finally able to seed that database. And once that was done, then the unit tests were able to go ahead and run. And uh, it says all eight of my tests passed. And that includes the controller method that was hitting the database. So I know that in this scenario, everything is also working. And that the Docker Compose here was solely responsible for all of those containers. So even in testing, I was able to just on the fly, have that database server created for me so that I could run these integration tests against the database, which is really a beautiful thing. And whether you're sharing all of this source code across your team and everybody's getting that benefit, or even pushing this up to a CI CD server, and then the CI CD server can have many in instances of SQL Server running while it's performing tests because Docker's going to just manage all of them for you. So everything's going great with the project. The developers and everybody on the team are so happy they don't have to install or manage SQL Server on their computers anymore. Um, we even got a new person that came in on the team and it was really easy to get that developer's system up and running because we didn't have to install all kinds of different tooling and frameworks or SQL Server. So the product owner comes and says, you know, those Agilist practitioners, they're so smart. They're so creative. Having one category to track the work they do isn't enough. We need to add another category. So no big deal. Just make some modifications to the Agilist class, maybe to the tests, maybe to the controller. But in the old days, the idea of the change to make in the database might cause a little bit of panic, right? Because, oh God, we've got to uh, 
get the SQL script across to everybody in the team, and then they have to make sure that they update their development database, and then we have to make sure that the testing database has the right fields in it, right? All of that. But now, thanks to having the SQL Server database in a container, this is really, really easy to do. Let me show you. So the only real change I have to make here in my code is to add the secondary focus ID into the Agilista class. And I might do other things elsewhere in the API that take advantage of that. For keeping the database in sync, I added a third SQL file. And this is really all I need to do. I need to feed this SQL file along with the other two to Flyway, and it will make sure that every time it creates the new database in the database container, that it does everything it needs to do, including running this script, and this script adds the new secondary focus ID to the Agilistas table, and it also makes sure that some of the seeded data also have a secondary focus ID in the Agilistas. So I also want to point out that uh, Flyway does have a naming convention for the SQL files. There's some flexibility there. I'm just following the simplest pattern, but that ensures that the um, SQL files are run in the right order. So that's really all I need to do is add this SQL file into the Flyway's SQL folder, and then the rest will just happen the way it happened before. So I'll go ahead and compose up the API and I'm fast forwarding again. Okay, so I see the Flyway container has stopped. That's my clue that I can go and browse to my API. So all of those pieces are still working together. And in addition, I can see that my database has been updated. There's the actual seed data from some of the Agilistas, so that data is definitely getting persisted, and I'm reading from it, and I'm getting it back out of the database. So using Flyway to automatically do all those migrations and using the container and the SQL Server database container, all of that got automated, and that was just part of the process now. It's just another component in my application, and everything is uh, shared by source control. So one other thing to note is the tests. So let me first take down these containers. And I did add one more integration test in here that verifies not only am I getting back another property on my Agilista, but that that persisted data is coming out of the database. So all of that is interacting properly. So that's what that last test does. I'm not going to right click to run Docker Compose on that. So here's Docker Compose test up without the interactive parameter. And I'll do the same thing here because this is a uh, feels like a long wait. I'll fast forward for you. In the end, all we care about is that all nine of my tests passed in the testing project and the orchestration to get all those containers up and running in an automated way, all of that is falling, falling into place and syncing up as well. So hopefully you agree with me that having a database in a Docker container as part of the development experience is just an amazing boon to the team. The database doesn't have to be this whole extra thing for every single person on the team to have to worry about, not just the database, but, you know, all of that effort of dealing with the evolving database schemas, things like that. Um, I mean, all I had to do for enabling this was to add some extra YAML into my Docker Compose file, right? That was it. And then all I had to do to make sure that the database got migrated as the application was evolving was add a SQL script in there and then source control. And the again, Docker Compose just took care of making all of that happen. I hope that this is something that you'll look into for your teams. Thank you so much for attending my session. And I'm really so happy that DockerCon was able to
pull off this live event and that I get a chance to actually interact with you and chat with you after this session. Thanks.